Welcome to Brain Lady Speaks with Julie Anderson on the Lessons in Joyful Living Radio Network. Julie Brain Lady Anderson is considered to be one of the nation's top experts on the brain personality connection. She has been inspiring her audiences to fire up their brains and ignite positive changes in their relationships. And now she is here to bring that knowledge to you. The information she shares will help those who hear it to accelerate their success in life and business through the discovery of their natural gifts and maximizing their brain power. When you learn to tap into the potential of your natural gifts and the power of the brain-mind connection, there is no limit to what you can accomplish. Today and every Wednesday on Brain Lady Speaks, you'll explore the latest findings to see how they have practical application in your life. And now, get ready to join Julie Anderson on Brain Lady Speaks on the Lessons in Joyful Living Radio Network. Take it away, Julie. All righty. Good morning. Good morning on this amazing Wednesday morning, February 17th. You are on the Brain Lady Speaks radio show. I am Julie Brain Lady Anderson. Thank you so much for taking this time this morning to spend with me uh, <clears throat> talking about some fun brain personality connection stuff. Um, it is an amazing day here in Northern California. It's kind of funny. We had a absolutely beautiful weather the last week, 70 degrees, uh, sunshine. And then all of a sudden last night, this storm literally blew in. We've got wind advisories, wind gusts at 45 to 50 miles an hour, and it's overcast and we're expecting rain. It's just so cool. I just love it. I love the energy in the air. I love the the <clears throat> shift in the weather. Um, about the only thing that, that's getting to me a little bit is allergies. So if you hear me a little congested this morning <laughs> and a few uh, coughs throughout the show, I apologize for that. A little uh, post-nasal drip is getting to me a little bit, but that's okay. It's a beautiful time of year. We've got some blooms out there, so long as too many of them don't get <laughs> blown away in this storm, we'll be doing all right. We'll be doing okay. But uh, I'm happy to have you here. I appreciate you taking the time to spend with me. I also want to encourage everyone, uh, if you like what you're hearing on the show, if you like what you're learning on the show, be sure to connect with me on the other media outlets. You know, hook up with me on uh, social media. Uh, I am at, on Twitter. I am at Brain Lady. You can follow me there. Uh, on Facebook, I am Purple Brain Lady or Brain Lady Julie, Julie Anderson. You can find me probably either way. And I'm always posting uh, positive things, um, articles, interesting things that I find in the world of neuroscience and as it applies to us in our day-to-day -day life. Um, sometimes it's just downright fascinating what they're, I shouldn't say sometimes, most of the time it is just downright fascinating what they're finding in the field of neuroscience and how that information applies or we can use it in our day-to-day -day lives and relationships. So a lot of times I'll post um, other articles by some of the neuroscientists that I follow. And then oftentimes I just post some encouraging uh, positive things. If you've listened to the January programs, you know I'm all about positive thought. Uh, we have a collaborative book coming out this year on thinking positive and being positive. If you want to be a part of that, be sure to connect with me. That's going to be an amazing um, author, co-authored uh, book that we're going to have. So lots of positive things that we, we post on the, on the pages. And then also on Wednesdays, Wednesday is what I call my whatever Wednesday. Wednesday is my fun Wednesday. <laughs> so next month you're going to learn a lot about what I call brain quadrant dominance and, and how different people use different portions of their brain. And I'm going to talk about sarcasm a little bit and where the home of sarcasm is in the brain and how some of us just may tend to be a little bit more sarcastic than others. So I kind of dubbed whatever Wednesday, Wednesday as my whatever Wednesday for my Facebook and my Twitter posts. So you might not be surprised <laughs> to find some sarcastic posts on there from time to time. I try to maintain only doing it on Wednesday. Um, and I, I dubbed it that, that whatever Wednesday, which means that I can post these sarcastic posts and you can't hold it against me. That's the rule. <laughs> That's the rule. <laughs> Um, we keep it clean, but we keep it fun because you got to laugh. You know, you know humor's, humor is excellent for the brain. It creates endorphins. It makes us happy. Um, it's a natural painkiller, laughter is. So, yeah, laughter's good. So we th try to throw in some of that 
as well throughout the week. But mostly on Wednesday, you're going to find those little sarcastic quotes in there. Um, but anyways, enough about enough about Facebook. Back to um, back to getting in touch with me. And if you want to get in touch with me, if you have any questions about anything that we talk about here on the show or you want to know inf- more information about something that I've discussed or about an upcoming program that we have, uh, feel free to email us. And our email address, of course, you can link if you go to the Lessons in Joyful Living network and you go to the Brain Lady Speaks radio page. Um, you can also go to brainladyspeaksradioshow.com and that's the radio show page. And there's all kinds of links there. Those links will take you to different things on the website, but it'll also give you, we try to do some complimentary downloads. I'm still working on the technical end of things, but I want to get some complimentary downloads. If if you can't get them directly on that page, you'll be able to get them from the Your Best Mind online website. And there's a link there for that website. So you can go there to yourbestmindonline.com and find out more about what we do. And if you have any questions, just email us at info at, so I-N-F-O, info at yourbestmindonline.com. And we'll we'll get right back at you. We'll try to answer them for you or get you answers if we don't know what the answer is. <laughs> okay. Send you in the right direction. All righty. So back to the topic. The topic for the month, or I should say the theme for the month of February, has been all about relationships. And every show has been focusing on different aspects of the brain personality connection thus far in February and how to utilize that information about the structure of our brains, the wiring of our brains, and how that is different between different individuals, uh, Jan or the first uh, February third, the first call in February, we talked about your sensory modality or the different communication styles, whether or not you're an auditory, a visual, or a kinesthetic, and how to utilize that information to improve your communication and reduce uh, miscommunications, and learn how to better solve problems when communication issues come up. Then last week, boy, we had a lot of fun on the 10th. If you didn't listen last week, you got to go back and listen because I jammed so much information on that call. It was all about he said, she said, who said what. It was those critical differences in the brain structure between a male brain, the average, average, okay, remember we're talking average, the average male brain and the average female brain and how that causes a different way of perspectives, a uh, different way of processing, and how that affects our interaction with the opposite sex. And, you know, sometimes we have uh, women that tend to have much more of a male brain. Literally, if you scan their brain, it's going to scan more like the male gender and <clears throat> vice versa. You know, you can have a man who scans more like a female brain. So it's not always, uh, you know, 100% of the time, but it does help us to understand that based on that hormonal um, flush that the brain gets during <clears throat> during development in the uterus, it, it adjusts the brain. And it definitely has different perspectives and different different ways of processing information. And that affects our communication and our relationships. So go back and listen to that one. That was a fun one. And then today we're going to talk about the next aspect that I think is really crucial to understand when we're talking about the brain personality connection. And it is definitely a brain thing. It comes from deep inside the brain, different portions of the brain like the amygdala and the hippocampus and uh, the frontal lobes. And it, it has to do with... Um, the introversion and extroversion level that different people have. And you have those complete opposites in in society. You have the very introverted individuals and the very extroverted individuals. And oftentimes they just kind of don't know how to interact with each other. And it causes conflicts or it causes a lot of misunderstandings. And I'm going to talk about those today. I'm going to share some of my own personal experiences within my family and how this has affected my relationships and being able to improve my relationships based on this information. So the topic for today is how to honor the introvert and be understanding of the extrovert uh, because there's definitely a difference in the brain of the two. Um, 
when we talk about introversion and extroversion, there's a couple things that I really want to emphasize. And one is, again, and I said, I've said this before, and I cannot say it enough. When I'm talking about differences, I'm just simply talking differences, okay? I don't want anyone to at any point in time feel that I'm saying one is superior to the other. You know, there's different brain strengths. There's different strengths that come with introverts and different strengths that come with extroverts. Same with male, female. Same with communication styles. It's just the way the brain is. So I'm just highlighting the differences and how to understand and honor those differences. Not ever at any point in time saying that one is um, superior to the other, one is better than the other. So I want you to keep that in mind as I go through. I want you to be able to use this information as a bridge for understanding and to improve your uh, communication and your relationships with other individuals. I also want to emphasize that when we're talking about this, we're not talking about, I'm not going to be talking about um, whether or not you're shy or outspoken. Oftentimes people will confuse the two. Being introverted means you're shy or being out, or extroverted means you're just outspoken. And really when you're talking about those two personality traits, they're more connected to psychology. They're more connected to the, you know, your confidence level, your, your self-image. They're not necessarily connected to the structure of the brain. And remember, we're talking science behind the psychology. So when we're talking today about introverts and extroverts, and we'll deal with um, with self-esteem issues and things like that on future calls, but when we're talking today is we're emphasizing the structural difference in the brain between the introvert and the extrovert. So we're going to be doing a lot of the brain science. So I want to start off, before we go to break here, I want to start off by just laying that groundwork and having you understand that you might find some some similarities you might find that you relate to one over the other but make sure that it's you're relating to it based on the actual way you feel and the structure in your brain as opposed to perhaps some self-esteem um feelings that you might need to be working with or getting over or dealing with and like i said we're going to be talking about that at, on a future show uh, so keep that in mind and as we go to break i want you to be sure to get comfortable get something to drink stay hydrated because we're going to come back with some pretty powerful information about introverts extroverts and then we're even going to talk about ambiverts a lot of people haven't even heard that term but we're going to explain what an ambivert is all right so hold on for just a few minutes or just a short break here and we'll come right back with the brain lady speaks radio program With her thorough understanding of brain chemistry, Julie Anderson provides you with tools and processes that will change your life in a positive way. Julie uniquely blends science and psychology when she shares her knowledge and information with businesses, entrepreneurs, women's groups, and families to improve workplace morale and productivity, parents creating dynamic relationships with their children, and women achieving more in life and business. Julie Anderson will be right back with Brain Lady Speaks on the Lessons in Joyful Living Radio Network. Welcome to Toginet. Cutting Edge Radio. Welcome back to Brain Lady Speaks on the Lessons in Joyful Living Radio Network. By including the latest scientific research on the brain personality connection, Julie Brain Lady Anderson provides her clients with the all important why behind what people do and how they think. The information she shares will help those who hear to accelerate their success in life and business through the discovery of their natural gifts and maximizing their brain power. Here again is your host, Julie Anderson, with Brain Lady Speaks on the Lessons in Joyful Living Radio Network. All righty. Welcome back. Welcome back to the Brain Lady Speaks radio show. And we are here talking about introverts and extroverts. And we're going to talk about ambiverts, too. So when you look at, let's just dive right in here. When you look at the split up of population throughout, in general, based on on uh, different studies that have been done over the years, and this, the first uh, terms that really were highlighted or kind of brought to into popularity was way back, you know, um, over a hundred years ago with Carl Jung or about 100 years ago with Carl Jung and his studies. And he talked a lot about introverts and extroverts, and he really 
in in his opinion, that was the brain personality connection right there. You were either an introvert or you're an ambervert. And that was, you know, you fit into one of those two categories. Over the years and throughout all of the scientific scanning of the brain, we know a lot more than what started out way back then. But um, there's, there, it's interesting to look at the population and to realize that you have kind of an equal amount of the population split into the extremes. And a lot of the things that I'm going to be talking about today, a lot of the characteristics fit into, <clears throat> pardon me, the extremes on either end of the scale. So you have extreme introverts that make up somewhere between, you know, 15 to 30 percent of the population. Um, and then you have your extreme extroverts, which are on the opposite end, making up, you know, that 15 to 30 percent of the population on the opposite end. And then you have this this centerpiece of individuals that I'm going to talk about that run either on the mild end of extroversion or the mild end of introversion and ambiversion. You know, you have a good 30% of the population that are ambiverts, and we're going to discuss that. But what I want to do is I want to talk about, like I said, I like doing the, um, you know, the science behind the psychology. So when we're talking about introverts and ambiverts and the difference between the two, it really all starts in the reticular activating system in the brain. So it's this, it's called the RAS. It's this little portion of the brain, and it has, it's kind of what sets the, volume on your world speaker, so to speak, um, how much incoming data, how much incoming stimulus from the outside does your brain want at any given point in time to function at its highest peak, to function uh, at its best. Uh, and it's different. For the introvert, it's like they have the volume control way down. They, they are, they're satisfied with very little external stimulus coming in throughout the day. Whereas the introvert or the extrovert, rather, they have this volume control set way up. You know, they want, <clears throat> pardon me again, a lot of incoming data to keep their brain going. So if you kind of visualize, if you kind of look at it this way, the, the brain of the introvert is naturally wide awake. Okay, it is wide awake. It is on all the time. So it doesn't need much going on out in front of it to keep it going, to keep it stimulated, because it's very self-stimulated, whereas the extrovert's just the opposite. The extrovert has a very naturally sleepy brain, and this seems kind of backwards, but when you're talking about brain science, this is really the way it is. It's naturally kind of asleep. So if it's constantly seeking out external stimulus to keep it awake and to keep it going. And this affects our interaction with the world. Um, introverts actually, you know, when you talk about this reticular activating system, too much stimulus is going to change, is going to kind of overwhelm that introvert. They may seem to be um, antisocial, they may seem to be uh, loners, but it, it has, it comes down to this stimulus type of a situation in the brain. And too much stimulus is going to overwhelm them. And the opposite is going to happen with those extroverts. The extroverts are going to seek out those highly stimulated situ situations. So they may actually appear to be like these little party animals that are constantly going and doing things. But in actuality, it's, it's what their brain does. When you look at the pathways for, um, for the, in the brains of the introverts and the extroverts, it's, it's a little different. The, the, in the introvert, they have a longer acetylcholine pathway and the intro, extroverts have a shorter um, dopamine pathway. So their brains, just in the actual way that the neurotransmitters communicate and move throughout the brain is different. And this affects the interaction of the way that they interact within society, and the way that they uh, perceive things and the incoming data that comes in. The hypothalamus in the brain of the introvert oftentimes sees things very close up. So everything is like um, bigger than life in their brains. And the introvert, uh, they have this, um, or the extrovert rather, they have 
it, just the opposite. You know, look at it, think of of the world in the sense of taking pictures through a big, huge, wide angle lens. This is the way that the introvert works. The introvert takes pictures with these huge, um, huge camera lens and wide angle. So they only need to take like one picture a day. And then they can spend the rest of the day digesting and processing all of the details that are in this picture. So they have this naturally high level of stimulus and alertness in their brain. And if they if they can't take too many of these pictures because then it's just going to be too much information for them to process. So to protect their brain from overstimulation, they're going to always lean towards quiet or low stimulus um, non-combative, non-competitive type of situations and lifestyles. That's the way they're going to live their life, right? Whereas the extrovert is on the extreme, you know, part of the scale. They're taking pictures through this tight telephoto lens, right? So they're going through their life throughout the day to keep their brain happy and to keep incoming information to process. They're taking these, they're just taking lots of little snapshots. It's all day, boom, 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 boom. They're constantly getting all of this extra information and because their lens is just small. It can't take in that much detail all at once. So they're going to <clears throat> lean or gravitate towards situations that are going to provide them with all those extra pictures, right? It's going to keep their brain being happy. And it, it sometimes it may seem like they're in this, you know, really... Um, overstimulating environment that would kill most people. But for them, they can function very highly in those situations and very, very well. Uh, I like sharing the, I told you I was going to share some personal experiences of some family. My um, brother-in-law, when he was dating my sister, my older sister, this was goes back, you know, 35 years ago, when he was dating her, now he is an extreme extrovert. He was up there, maybe not in that very top, top, top 5%, but he was, you know, he was in the top 15, 20% of the population that are, you know, in that high extrovert situation. And he was always, always on, always going, going, going. And he, um, when he would come visit us and dating my sister and he would come visit us, he would, if you did not actively engage with him in a conversation or he didn't sit down in front of a football game or a sports activity, I am not exaggerating when I say within five minutes he would fall asleep just sitting there. It would crack us up. We'd be like, Greg, hello. You know, and he'd wake right back up. It's not like he'd go into this, you know, dead sleep. But it's like if you did not engage his brain, it, it's a perfect example of how his brain was just so naturally sleepy that it, it would just shut down. It would shut down. Now, the man could go for 20 hours a day, but only if there was that stimulus going on. And, you know, constantly keeping him going. And that's the brain of, of an extrovert, right? As a matter of fact, their brain, they actually, um, their performance increases. They do better in high stimulus type of a situation. They're individuals that when testing is done, if there is noise in the background, if there's some kind of um, white noise, they actually perform better and score higher on tests. If there's something going on that just keeps their brain active, keeps their brain engaged, whereas introverts, they have to have it completely quiet, right? They can't have this extra stimulation. If there's distractions, their performance decreases, and it has to do with the brain. Going back to the brain for a minute, when you're talking about the amygdala in the brain, for the uh, the introvert, what happens is, and we talked about the amygdala a little bit in January, this is the area of the brain that identifies the uh, fight or flight, you know, conserve, withdraw. This is the fear sector in the brain. So if the brain of the introvert begins to feel overstimulated, that, that automated portion, remember this is kind of down in your subconscious. This isn't something that, that we can control it with a lot of thinking, but most of the time it's just running on autopilot. And so what happens is for the introverts, if they're in a high stimulus situation, they may not even realize it, but their amygdala is going, oh my goodness, there is way too much stimulus coming into this brain and you need to run. You need to get out of this situation. So this is when the introverts um, begin to shut down and they get very quiet. Uh, they draw back. Another good um, example of introverts and extroverts within my own family, the... Um, 
my sister, so that was my older sister that was dating Greg 35 years ago, okay, who had, who was the extrovert. Well, one of my younger sisters, Tara, she is very, very much on the introverted side. Again, probably not, she's not clear down on the, you know, five to 10%. She is, she's, you know, probably within the 30% of the population that are are introverts. And she gets overstimulated very easy. She had a very difficult time in school because she was a real life example of this performance decreasing with too much stimulation. Her, she would actually get sick. She would physically get ill with too many days in a public school. Uh, She was constantly coming home ill to the point where she would run a fever. Okay. So this shows you just how much physically um, your body can be affected by, you know, external stimulation if you are an introvert. It was so painful for her that she would, she would physically get ill. And I oftentimes share the story of when we would get together, my sisters and I will get together a lot of times. Um, my sisters, my mom, and my two nieces. So there's five daughters, my mother, and then two nieces. So a total of eight of us would get together and we'd go on these weekend trips and just girl trips. And most of us are either ambiverts or extroverts, except for two of them. And Tara was one of those two. And inevitably, we'd be sitting around the table laughing, joking, playing games, and it would start to get very loud, very high stimulus. And Tara would always get up and move away from the table and go sit in a corner of the room. Now, before we knew this information about the brain personality connection, us extroverted sisters would kind of roll our eyes at each other and go, oh, she's such a party pooper. What is wrong with her? She does this all the time, right? And then when I learned this information, I felt so bad. Oh my goodness. Guilt just hit me over the head because I realized what was happening. It was never that Tara was being a party pooper. It was never that Tara didn't was being antisocial. Tara's brain was just simply way overwhelmed and it couldn't take it. So she still wanted to be with us as a family, right? But she had to move herself. Her brain made her physically move away to a quieter spot so she could be with the family, but she would be less overwhelmed. And that's kind of a, that's a really good example of an introvert. And there's lots more to talk about on the introversion, extroversion scale. And when we come back from break, I'm going to go into more details about how to apply this information, um, the differences between the introverts and extroverts, and why it's so important to honor the introvert and be very understanding of that extrovert. So grab some water and come back with me after break on the Brain Lady Speaks radio show. With her thorough understanding of brain chemistry, Julie Anderson provides you with tools and processes that will change your life in a positive way. Julie uniquely blends science and psychology when she shares her knowledge and information with businesses, entrepreneurs, women's groups, and families to improve workplace morale and productivity, parents creating dynamic relationships with their children, and women achieving more in life and business. Julie Anderson will be right back with Brain Lady Speaks on the Lessons in Joyful Living Radio Network. It's the Fitness Minute with fitness expert, Annette Hammond. A life of daily exercise and healthy eating has been found to prevent Alzheimer's disease. With 35 million cases in the U.S. and the world, a new study published in The Lancet Neurology shows that healthy living can prevent Alzheimer's. The study states that not enough physical activity is the number one preventable factor that contributes to the disease. About one-third of the U.S. population is sedentary, so the highest risk factor is also extremely widespread but easy to remedy. The other conditions the study cites are depression, obesity, diabetes, smoking, high blood pressure, low education, and not using your brain efficiently. They say living a healthy life and eliminating these behaviors in your life will help prevent Alzheimer's disease. For the Fitness Minute, I'm Annette Hammond. Being in a bad marriage or relationship can make your life miserable. But staying in a bad marriage or relationship is not only miserable, but it should be unacceptable. Join relationship coach Lindsay Ellison each week for her new show, Start Over, Find Happiness, where she gives expert advice on all things divorce and breaking up, dating after divorce, 
good sex, bad sex, the importance of self-love, setting boundaries, how to find love again, loving toxic partners, as well as Lindsay's own journey of divorce and rediscovery that has inspired millions of women around the world. You can also sign up for her coaching program, Thrive, which helps anyone navigate through the disparity of breaking up and starting a new journey. Join Lindsay Ellison every Monday, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific on the Lessons in Joyful Living Radio Network. Go to lindsayellison.com for more information. Welcome back to Brain Lady Speaks on the Lessons in Joyful Living Radio Network. By including the latest scientific research on the brain personality connection, Julie Brain Lady Anderson provides her clients with the all-important why behind what people do and how they think. The information she shares will help those who hear to accelerate their success in life and business through the discovery of their natural gifts and maximizing their brain power. Here again is your host, Julie Anderson, with Brain Lady Speaks on the Lessons in Joyful Living Radio Network. Alrighty, welcome back. Welcome back to the <clears throat> next segment of the Brain Lady Speaks radio show. Again, we are here in February talking about relationships, all about relationships, understanding the brain personality connection. And today's topic is introversion and extroversion and how to understand that, what it really is from a scientific point of view, what it has to do with the brain. And then how do you really apply that information into, into life? Uh, we were talking about introverts right before I, we went to break, and I wanted to come back. I found this quote from the book Quiet by Suzanne Cain, and I really like it. I, I love quotes. I think, um, I think sharing the, the wisdom that other people have already spoken it's sometimes just, it, you know, why try to reinvent it if somebody else said it so beautifully? And she says it really well. This is what she says here about introverts. She says, introverts, in contrast to an extrovert, may have strong social skills and enjoy parties and business meetings, but after a while wish they were home in their pajamas. They prefer to devote their social energies to close friends, colleagues, and family. They listen more than they talk. They think more than they speak and often feel as if they express themselves better in writing than in conversations. They tend to dislike conflict and may have a horror of small talk but enjoy deep conversations. I really like that because sometimes, again, we we put these negative tags on um, on labels on individuals. For some reason, we just do that. You know, it's such a, it's a bad habit that, that humans have gotten into. You know, they, it, they see a beautiful white sheet uh, that has one black mark on it. And that's the only thing that they see instead of the intricate design that's on the beautiful white sheet, right? They just see the one black mark or the one tear or whatever it is. And that's what kind of happens a lot of times with the introverts. And I was kind of sharing that story before we went to break how in my own life, we used to look at my sister as as almost being rude. You know, she was a party pooper. She didn't want to be a part of the group of the family games until we realized that what we were really doing is we were overwhelming her brain and her reticular activating system was just saying, tilt, I can't do this anymore. I have to conserve and withdraw. So for the introverts, it really has nothing to do with how much they like to be around people. It's how many people do they like to be around? So they have these deep relationships. They have these close friends and colleagues and family that they want to be around, but they're not always going to be throwing themselves into the large social settings because not because they're rude, not because they are, they're antisocial, but because they just simply, their brain just gets overwhelmed in that situation. They have too many details going into that wide angle lens and they have to step back. They have to spend time alone to be able to uh, to function and to process that information. So there we talked about how that's going to affect the introverts, whereas the extroverts now, uh, they're of course going to love these. The, the in, Those of us extroverts in my family, you know, we love those times when we're together and we're laughing and, you know, there's cards flying around the table, that's great for an extrovert because we're just enjoying um, 
you know, all that extra brain stimulus that's coming our way and all that silliness that's coming our way. So for us, we we thrive in those types of situations, individuals who are on the extroverted side. And our, you know, our activity, actually, we can get more done when there's more around. If it's quiet, we're going to get in trouble. You know, <laughs> it's like, oh, I've got a long list of things to do today. If I don't have music playing in the background, I find myself wandering throughout the house, you know, because there's just not enough going on to keep my brain awake. So we're oftentimes seeking out, you know, stimulated situations. It's also interesting that the introverts tend to process internally. Now, last week we talked about the male-female brain and how women tend to process externally and men tend to process internally. So now this can either override the male-female difference or it can make it even more extreme. So let me explain what I mean by that. So men in general are external, are internal processors. All right. If you have an introverted male, he's going to be on the hyper side of internal processing. In other words, he's almost always going to be processing in his brain and only spitting out very few words as an answer. And you can have <clears throat> an introverted female who normally, so that's that's one extreme. Now, on the opposite, um, it can override. So it can, it can make it more definite, like with that male, or with the female, it may override. So you may have women that tend to external process in general. But if you have an extremely introverted woman, she may internally process, even though she has a female brain. Because her introversion overrides the brain sex, if that makes sense. So she may, you may say, well, I know, you know, Susie, my next door neighbor, she's a woman and she always process, she never, you know, she always thinks internally. She's a deep thinker, internal thinker. Well, it could be that she's just very introverted. So they kind of start, you, you're starting to see as we build on the brain personality connection, all these different um, aspects and how they affect in, um, in real life. Okay. So with that, keep that in mind as we go through this. Now, this makes this the way that the brain works in the introverts and the extroverts makes the introvert more conservative and more suspicious of new things. So they're not going to always be the ones that sign up to go on that, you know, exciting outing or, uh, you know, go to the big amusement park. This is a big thing with my husband and I. I'm more on the extroverted side. He's much more on the introverted side. And for him... Um, I love Disneyland. I'm sitting here. If you, if you saw my office, you'd crack up, you know, there's Mickey ears all over the place. I'm sipping out of a, out of a Mickey or a Disney parks cup. You know, I love Disneyland. And one of the things I love about Disneyland is, is, uh, all the stimulus, right? For my husband, not so much. Uh, he'll go to be with people, but because his brain is more introverted, he gets overwhelmed very easy in those situations. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't any introverts walking through Disneyland or through amusement parks. I'm just saying that in general, they're going to prefer the non-busy days. You know, they're not going to go during summer. Um, they're not going to spend as many days or as long of days there, or they're going to seek out the quieter areas of the park because they're going to be aware of you know, those high stimulus situations. Whereas they would love to take a day hike in the woods where it's quiet and peaceful and there's not, you know, this overwhelming amount of stimulation going on, especially if it's with the two or three or four people that they are really close to. So again, not antisocial. They're just more conservative. Whereas the extroverts, they're way less conservative. They're big risk takers. They're like, yeah, man, let's go. Let's do this something new because it's going to be exciting and it's going to provide my brain with stimulus. <clears throat> so, that's, you know, again, it's a difference in the brains. Interestingly enough, in statistics show that smoking is less common within with uh, um, introverts and more common with extroverts. And they are feel experts feel that this has to do a lot with um, the social aspect of it. You know, that smoking tends to be a social thing a lot of times. So it, it's it's a way to connect with people and extroverts love to connect with people, even if they're not people persons. Does that make sense? So they may not overly love people and personalities, but people provide them with the stimulus that they need to keep their brain healthy and awake. 
And you can even look at children. Uh, you can find out early on as babies even where uh, your introverts and extroverts are going to fall because the baby of the introvert maybe doesn't like, if it's an introverted baby, they might not um, like to be held that much. They may be the ones that you they want to be in the, in their crib laying down to go to sleep. They want to be at home in a quiet atmosphere when they are taking their naps. They don't like being out. They like that routine. Uh, they may be the ones that the littlest noise will wake them up. That could be the introvert. The extroverted baby are the ones that take shorter naps. They like to be held a lot. They like to be held while they're taking their naps. Uh, they probably sleep better in the car. <laughs> you know, They sleep, they'll, you'll be walking down a mall and they're sound asleep because that's the way their brain is functioning and their brain works. Now, it's interesting when, we're, when we come back from break, because we're going to take a break here in a couple minutes. When we come back, we're going to really talk about the dangers connected to, to each of these extremes and a little bit about ambiverts, because introverts tend to be at a higher risk of depression, and extroverts tend to be at a higher risk of adaption. So there's danger on either end of the scale. Uh, extroverts are not, or introverts rather, are not going to always be comfortable discussing their problems or their emotions with individuals if that, if they think that's going to cause them too much stimulus. So they're more internalizing all of their pain and their problems, and that puts them at a higher risk of depression, and therefore oftentimes a higher risk of quiet suicides. Not necessarily suicides altogether, but if you have someone in a very depressive state and they are introverts, be aware of that. Uh, keep an eye on them. Stay in touch with them, right? Because, and, and I'm not trying to give medical advice here at all, but it's something to watch for because the introverts are not always going to let people know how they feel. And the extroverts, they're going to they're gonna probably get, wind up getting in or could get in trouble from time to time because they're going to adapt. They're going to adapt to do whatever they can to fit in however they can fit in because their brain wants that stimulus. So there's dangers for the personalities that are at either end of this scale, all right? When we come back, we're going to talk about some of those, a little bit more about the negative topics that, or titles that we tend to put on these people, how we can stop doing that, a little bit about ambiverts, and then how we can honor that the introverts and be understanding of the extroverts and the extra energy style. And we're going to talk a little bit about ADD too. So come back, join me back in a few seconds on the Brain Lady Speaks radio show. With her thorough understanding of brain chemistry, Julie Anderson provides you with tools and processes that will change your life in a positive way. Julie uniquely blends science and psychology when she shares her knowledge and information with businesses, entrepreneurs, women's groups, and families to improve workplace morale and productivity, parents creating dynamic relationships with their children, and women achieving more in life and business. Julie Anderson will be right back with Brain Lady Speaks on the Lessons in Joyful Living Radio Network. February is National Chocolate Month. Historians say the Aztecs discovered chocolate 3,100 years ago, and it was revered to the point of worship. The word chocolate comes from the Aztec word chocolatl, which referred to the bitter, spicy drink the Aztecs made from the cacao beans. The first chocolate bar was invented in 1847 by Joseph Fry. Did you know that it takes one year for a cacao tree to produce enough pods to make 10 and chocolate bars. The scientific name for the tree that chocolate comes from, Theobroma cacao, means food of the gods. Man cannot live by chocolate alone, but we women sure can. Personally, I could give up chocolate, but I'm not a quitter. It's 
Carolyn Davidson, and you can have fun challenging your words you never heard vocabulary with my free app, Too Funny for Words. From quantum physics to metaphysics, cryptozoology to conspiracy theory, energy healing to angels, on Into the Light Paranormal Radio, we're here to tell you that just because you haven't experienced it doesn't mean it's not real. Each episode, Kitty Janice, Kimberly Rinaldi, and their guests have one goal, and that's to bring another conversation and another bit of consciousness into the light. Into the Light Paranormal Radio, Thursdays at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, on the Lessons in Joyful Living Radio Network. Welcome back to Brain Lady Speaks on the Lessons in Joyful Living Radio Network. By including the latest scientific research on the brain personality connection, Julie Brain Lady Anderson provides her clients with the all important why behind what people do and how they think. The information she shares will help those who hear to accelerate their success in life and business through the discovery of their natural gifts and maximizing their brain power. Here again is your host, Julie Anderson, with Brain Lady Speaks on the Lessons in Joyful Living Radio Network. All right. Welcome back. Welcome back. Okay. So we're going to get some final information here in this last segment of the show. Um, Try to pull in some important points. Hit the important points. (laughs) One thing that I always want to – so we really talked a lot about the introverts, right? And I want to highlight the extroverts here a little bit for just a minute or two. Oftentimes, the extreme extrovert, the personality traits of the extreme extrovert – mimics or looks a lot like those with ADD, okay? People who have that very fast attention span or have been labeled ADD or ADHD. Honestly, there is, when you look at the brain, there is a chemical imbalance that causes attention deficit disorder or a hyperactive disorder. And all too often, we have little extroverted individuals coming into school systems where they're expected to act like an ambivert or an introvert, and I'll explain an ambivert ambivert in a minute, sit still, be still, stay in low stimulus situations and be quiet, and their brains just can't do it. So in their little undisciplined, immature brains, what do they do? They create havoc. They, They have to wiggle. They have to move. They have to tap. They have to make noises. They have to talk to their the little kids sitting next to them. It may be that they're just an extroverted child. So, or you're, or you may be an extroverted adult. So just be careful when slapping this label on, think about, do some research or listen to the show and really look at, or go, go to the website and, and get one of the programs that explains introversion and extroversion that we have in more detail and understand that a true extrovert is not ADD or ADHD. And beware of labeling our little children this. It just means that their learning span, their learning time span needs to move faster. Um, They're highly intelligent. They just have to keep it moving. Uh, You know, 15 minutes on this subject, 15 minutes on this subject. Then you can go back to the first subject. But it, it, beware of this. Pay attention. Start analyzing your kids. It may not mean that they need drugs or that they need medication. It could be that they're just extroverted. Because this is what winds up happening. A lot of times you get these negative labels slapped on either extreme. Um, You look at the introverts and people think they're too quiet. They're loners. They're stuck up. They're scaredy cats. But as I've explained, it has to do with their reticular activating system. It has to do with the acetylcholine and dopamine pathways. It's the way their brain works. The extreme extroverts sometimes are labeled as being too noisy, restless, maybe undisciplined, you know, because they just can't stay in one um, one place or one position or be still for too long. Get that ADHD or ADD label. Be cautious of that. It could just be that it's the way their brain is wired. They've got to get the extra stimulus to stay engaged. And if you find that you are on either end of this scale and you find that you have been Um, criticized or looked at in a negative manner because of your natural brain gift under it start to start to deal with that and start to put those negative override those negative terms because it has nothing to do with that Um, you're not if you're an introvert you're not antisocial your brain just can't take the extra stimulus and that's okay there's nothing wrong with that Honor that and ask for that in return. And with the extroverts, you know, to understand that people around you are not going to always understand, uh, always be um, 
cool with your extra energy. So learn to to interact, but not to feel negative about the fact that you have it. Just find the outlets that are going to um, help your brain stay stimulated. I said that I wanted to talk for a minute about something called an ambivert. And when I do these presentations, a lot of times people look at me and they go, huh, what's an ambivert? Guess what? An ambivert is normally comfortable in both groups and enjoys um, or, or can relate sometimes to the introvert and sometimes to the extrovert. They're comfortable with enjoy with groups and enjoy social interactions. However, they also enjoy their time alone, away from the crowd. So if you look at hours in a day, the extreme introvert is way over on one scale. They may like, um, you know, 80% of their daytime hours, their waking hours to be spent um, alone or with very few people or low stimulus situations. The extreme extrovert wants probably 80% of their waking hours to be interacting in high stimulus situations. The ambivert is right smack down the middle. Okay, they're probably 50-50. They can, they can function in either situation, but want uh, both situations, if that makes any sense. So, for example, if you're an ambivert and you are out today at that amusement park, right, and or at uh, running errands or at networking events or doing whatever, you're constantly stimulated. Well, tomorrow you might want to spend alone at home in the quiet, in downtime. All right. So you can, that's kind of what an ambivert is. They're right down the middle and they can relate to both sides. And when, like I said, when I do these presentations, I have people come up to me afterwards and they're like, oh my goodness, I finally got it. You know, I've heard about introverts and ambiverts all my life. And I, I always felt that sometimes I was one and sometimes I was the other. And I never understood how that could possibly be. Well, now you know how that could possibly be because technically you're not an introvert and you're not an extrovert. You are an ambivert. So you are right down the middle, right down the middle. So how do we, what's the best way to really honor the introverts and be understanding of the extroverts? This is, this is where it really becomes key in our relationships because back to that theme of, you know, your, your relationship February How do you utilize this information? How does it go from just being cool, interesting, pardon me, scientific stuff into something that is usable? Well, to begin with, I just gave you a bunch of information that's going to help you be understanding of the different brains and know that it's not... um, It's not being rude. It's not being obnoxious, okay? It's just the way the brains work. So for those introverts, first off, be be careful that you don't label them. Be understanding that their brain is a low stimulus brain and that there are going to be times when their brain's going to become overwhelmed. So you have to respect their need for privacy, respect their need for time alone. Um. If you know you have an introvert, don't put them on the spot in public. Um, Don't embarrass them in public because what that does is now all of a sudden a bunch of eyes are staring at them and those eyes are all uh, stimulus and it's, it's going to be painful for their, for their brain, right? Of course, you should never talk negatively about anyone, even in a teasing situation, but it is especially painful for those introverts. Allow introverts, this is a really big key, allow introverts to be the quiet part of the team. It's okay if they're the bench setters, right? The bench warmers. It's okay if they're sitting on the outside looking in. Um, allow them to observe, especially in the new situ- in new situations that might be overly um, overly stimulating. Don't ever put them on the spot and ask them for an answer. Uh, I never, when I'm doing my big events, you know, I never volunteer, automatically volunteer anyone. I never point to someone and say, will you come up and help me? I will always ask for volunteers because I don't know if they're an introvert. Um, Teachers, if you're a teacher, oh my goodness, never point to someone and say, Joey, give me this answer. If they're an introvert, it's going to kill them and their amygdala is going to kick in gear. All that oxygen is going to shrink out of their thinking portion of the brain and it's going to overwhelm them and it's going to make them sick and painful. Um, so don't interrupt them. Don't put them on the spot. Um, be sure that you 
a lot of your interaction, especially if you're teaching them something new or you're giving them any kind of coaching, it needs to be done in private. Uh, it needs to be done in a situation that doesn't uh, doesn't put them on the spot or make them feel that they're, you know, they need to run and flee. In public situations, you're going to notice that the introverts are almost always going to be sitting along the outside. They're going to be, um, if you're talking to them and they start looking away and their body language is, is turning away, then, uh, you know, be wary of that. Stop the conversation. Um, honor that. The extroverts respect their need for independence. Um, know that they're going to be in the center right? They're going to be in the center of everything. Um, they're most likely going to talk more, uh, encourage their enthusiasm, just give them a direction for it, give them an outlet for that, for it. Uh, if they have lots of ideas and they're auditory speakers, let them talk it out. Just understand that they're going to have a lot of energy. They're going to have, uh, you know, a lot of space that they're going to use. And that's okay. It's all right. It's acceptable. Okay, so in the end, take this into consideration. Look at the people in your life. Look at individuals, especially in your very close interpersonal relationships. Can you make some adjustments to honor the introvert and be very understanding of the extrovert? All right, I think it will definitely enrich your relationships. It's going to make them deeper and you're just going to have more fun. All right, so... That's the introverts and extroverts. Uh, I want to real quick talk about next week. Next week, we're going to have guests. We're going to have two guests, Orna and Matthew Walters. And they are the founders of Love on Purpose Revolution. It's a global online event that is dedicated to busting the myth that love is supposed to happen by accident. So they're going to talk a lot about creating love on purpose. It's going to be so much fun. So it'll wrap up our relationship month for February. And we'll be talking about um, their program that they have. And we're going to be talking about what led them on this journey to find each other. They're, they're quite popular. They have quite a few followers. And um, they've been featured on NBC, Fox News, USA Network, KBFK Radio, um, Les Brown, lots of different things. So please join me next week. That's going to be February 24th. And we're going to talk about finding love on purpose to wrap up our relationship month here in February. And again, thank you for being with me this week. Thank you for um, spending time to learn about the Brain Personality Connection and enrich your relationships here with Bra Julie Brain Lady Anderson. Follow me. Connect with me on Facebook. Connect with me on Twitter. Um, be sure to check this page. Check the on the Liv Lessons in Joyful Living Network. Check that page. Um, there's links to the website, there's links to connect with me more, and there's going to be um, links to free downloads as well as you can listen to this again. If, if you have introverts in your life, have them listen to it. Extroverts, have them listen to it. And thank you. Thank you. You have honored me with spending this time on the Brain Lady Speaks radio show. This is Julie Brain Lady Anderson signing off. Until next week, have an amazing week. for tuning in to this episode of Brain Lady Speaks with Julie Anderson. Julie Brain Lady Anderson is considered to be one of the nation's top experts on the brain personality connection.